folks can hop on. Okay, thanks. Okay, why don't we get started? So once again, this is Kathy Attar with Physicians for Social Responsibility. I'm the Toxics Program Manager, and we're very excited to present tonight's webinar entitled Hormone Disrupting Chemicals, and we're going to be talking about the latest research and also how to counsel patients on reducing day-to-day -day exposures related to endocrine disruptors. And um, as some of you might already know, hormone disrupting chemicals are used in many consumer products, including personal care items and children's products, such as car seats. However, few health professionals have been trained to help their patients understand how to reduce exposures to these harmful chemicals. And so in order to, to decrease risk of toxic exposures and also prevent the development of environmentally related diseases like asthma, learning disabilities, certain cancers. Um, healthcare providers must be trained in environmental health, and um, unfortunately, very few are. And so, PSR is trying to help fill this void by offering train the trainer webinars like tonight's, given by experts in the field of, field of environmental health. And what we're trying to do, what PSR, PSR is trying to do, is a two-step process. First, we're trying to train the trainer and then train new practitioners, new residents, new nursing students, and also the public. Um, and our goal is to train an adequate number of health professionals so that you can then begin offering these presentations, like I said, to area residency programs, community clinics, um, nursing programs, et cetera. And so we really are hoping that this second level of training will, will help you develop skills um, that will allow you to offer preventative environmental health guidance to your patients and also hope kind of pique your interest in becoming policy advocates um, for the environment and for improving uh, your patients and the public's health. And so this evening's webinar is the second in our series. Um, our next webinar will be focused on outdoor air toxics and will cover urban fracking. And we are looking to have that uh, presentation offered in late May. And so for this evening's presentation, which is going to be focusing on hormone disrupting chemicals, our presenter is Dr. Joanna Congleton. 
and Dr. Congleton is currently works as a senior scientist and toxicologist with the Environmental Working Group, an environmental and public health research and advocacy organization based here in Washington, D.C. She has over 17 years of experience working with environmental health organizations, including PSR, Clean Water Action, and the Sierra Club. She also served as the Executive Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility in Louisiana. And while there, she provided health assistance services to people impacted by Hurricane Katrina and Rita. And right now, Dr. Con Congleton continues to use her expertise in supportive programs that advance public health and environmental science education, education research, and policies. And Dr. Congleton holds a PhD in environmental toxicology from Cornell University and an MSPH in environmental science from Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. And she also has a BS in communications from Syracuse. And so before I turn it over to Dr. Congleton, I just want to go over a few housekeeping um, issues. So Dr. Congleton's presentation is divided into different sections. And so after each section, we're going to be taking questions. And so if you have a question, you can use the raise your, raise your hand icon. And once you press that hand icon, we will then unmute your phone line, and you can go ahead and ask your, your question. We'll also be taking questions after completion of the entire lecture. Um, and so. So let me now turn it over to uh, Dr. Congleton and to, in order to begin tonight's uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy, um, and thank you for everyone who joined this evening. Uh, so tonight I'll be talking about um, environmental endocrine disruptors and present to you a few case studies um, involving exposure and exposure prevention. Um, I have a few objectives for the evening. Um, first, I'd like to define what in endocrine disrupting compounds are and why there's concern. Um, the specific case studies that I'll present involve children's exposure to fire retardant chemicals, um, exposure via personal care products. I'll talk a little bit about A and then um, diethylhexylphthalate and medical devices and exposure um, prevention techniques there. Um, and then again, you know, hopefully giving you tools, um, you know, to communicate um, how to reduce exposure if patients have questions. So um, the endocrine system is a complex, very carefully orchestrated, fine-tuned system that regulates hormone signaling. Um, it's critical to a wide variety of essential biological functions and developmental processes. Um, including field development, growth, stress response, sexual development, produ production of um, insulin and glucagon, metabolism, intelligence, and behavior. So as defined by the National Inst Institutes of Environmental Health Science, endocrine disruptors are chemicals that may interfere with the body's endocrine system and produce adverse developmental, reproductive, neurological, and immune effects in both humans and wildlife. Um, as Kathy mentioned in the introduction, they're found in uh, many everyday products. They're ubiquitous in our environment, um, including plastics, food cans, um, food itself, cosmetics, and pesticides. And I'd like to emphasize that exposure to endocrine disrupting compounds may pose the greatest risk during prenatal and early postnatal development. So um, this is a reprinted um, image from uh, Moore, 1973, from The Developing Human. And I really wanted to emphasize here how there are critical windows of development that, that may be particularly susceptible to exposure to certain compounds. So for example, as you see from this image, that during um, certain embryonic periods, the uh, certain organs and systems are in stages of development, and so compounds that can specifically target those organs and systems can be, be particularly harmful. And I'd also like to mention to um, the bottom of this image where, you know, very, very early exposure after conception can result in prenatal death, where um, exposures during very um, early conception or mid-conception can result in morphological abnormalities. 
And then um, later on, we have more subtle physiological defects. Um, I, I'd also like to emphasize that exposure to um, hormonally active compounds does begin in the womb. Um, this is a study that my organization um, did in 2005, and there have been many other, others to support this point, where we looked at um, chemicals that were detectable in the cord blood of infants, and we found a variety of compounds that are known to be endocrine active including um, fire retardants, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, and bisphenol A, which has gotten a lot of um, scientific attention lately and is a weak um, estro estrogen agonist. It's important to remember when um, thinking about compounds that disrupt the endocrine system that they don't necessarily follow the law of toxicology. So this is a model where we have a linear dose-response relationship. Um, you know, toxicology has sort of traditionally dosed animals with um, fairly high amounts of a test compound and looked for overt effects. Um, endocrine active compounds challenge this model where we really need to start looking at lower doses because what we see is a non-monotonic do dose response curve. And this is how hormones act in the human body. There's not a linear dose response curve. So very low doses of a compound could have some effect uh, where you have a moderate dose, maybe doesn't produce a detectable effect, and the highest dose does. You could also invert this view where you get a maximal response at a moderate dose versus a low dose or a high dose. I'd also like to point everyone toward um, a much more detailed um, assessment of the state of the science on endocrine disrupting chemicals that was done by the World Health Organization and UNEP. Um, this is much more detail, of course, than I'll go into today, um, but by, I encourage everyone who's interested in this topic to um, to download this resource, it's available online. And I would also just like to highlight a few things that, um, that were stated in the report that are relevant to endocrine-related diseases being on the rise. So the World Health Organization report um, did a, a sort of global assessment of the state of the science and found that up to 40% of young men in some countries, this is mostly um, northern Europe where this has been assessed, have low semen quality. The incidence of genital malformations, that includes cryptorchidism and hypophadia in baby boys, has increased over time or leveled off unfavorably. Neural behavioral disorders associated with thyroid disruption um, affect a high proportion of children in some countries and have increased. Endocrine-related cancers, including cancers of the breast, endometrium, ovary, prostate, have been increasing over the past decade. There's also a trend toward earlier onset of breast development or HALARC in young girls um, in countries where this has been studied, so this is um, limited evidence. And then the prevalence, of, the prevalence of obesity and type 2 diabetes has dramatically increased worldwide. This was actually not part of the 2012 report. This was a recently up updated statistic um, where the World Health Organization reports that 1 in 10 people are obese and the number with type 2 diabetes has quadrupled to 422 million since 1980. And of course, these trends cannot be solely accounted for by exposure to um, envir environmental endocrine disruptors, but there's a growing body of science and evidence that they may be contributing factors. And hopefully by the end of this talk, um, I will have convinced you that, that there is definitely some merit to that. Uh, the WHO report concludes with um, a statement saying that the speed with which the increases in disease incidents have occurred in recent decades rule out genetic factors as the sole plausible explanation. Um, so that's sort of the mile-high overview of um, what endocrine disruptors are and why we should be concerned. And before I get into more specific examples. Um, if anyone has general questions, I would invite you to um, put those forward now. So, uh, Joanna, this is Kathy, and there are actually uh, several people wrote in some questions, and so Great. I can go ahead and ask the one well, I can ask 
um, I'll ask those right now for you. So the okay. first one is from from Melody Chrislock, and she wants to know what are the sources of um, the styrene, or and she also says the A keto phenolic lactic acid or slash styrene. The sources of, could you be a little more styrene as in the, the volatile, like a, the industrial chemical or? She, well, she also says, uh, what are the sources of, and then it's a, it's a particular acid, it's a keto phenyl lasic, lastic acid. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Okay. Um, if I can't answer something immediately, I can certainly yeah. follow up with people after the talk. Um, I would I would want to look into the specific compound. Okay. Okay. So then the, another question is, uh, Dr. Susan Katz has a question about um, how does the EPA estimate non-cancer risk now? Have they done anything to recognize low-dose effects of toxicants? Sure. So um, this is actually something that um, folks at EPA have been talking about a bit more recently. They have not formerly, like, sort of formally incorporated this into risk assessment. Um, they still do the traditional calculation based on identifying either a benchmark dose or null or lull for a specific compound and then applying uncertainty factors. Um, there has been, which are, which are sort of arbitrary factors of 10. Um, there, there has been discussion about um, trying to implement some of the National Academy of Sciences recommendations, which switches the risk assessment framework from one of um, using benchmark dose, nulls, wills, and uncertainty factors toward actually calculating a population risk, much as they do with cancer. Um, and applying that to non-cancer endpoints. Um, but again, you know, from what I've seen, that's under discussion, and it hasn't actually been implemented yet. So we're still, we're still sort of in the old framework, but, um, you know, for example, I did just attend a, um, a two-day uh, conference with um, NIEHS and EPA folks talking about how to actually use low-dose exposure and um, age-sensitive exposures into risk assessment. There's just sort of like a lot of talk about how that could be um, implemented in terms of what the calculations would be and what the strategy would be. Great, great. And so um, Melody uh, Chris Lock also has a question regarding she wanting to know about the sources of MTBE. Sure. So um, I can tell you what I know historically about MTBE. I haven't done a lot of recent research on that, but that is a, um, a byproduct of um, fuel exhaust. There, you know, a couple decades ago, there was a lot of discussion about um, water pollution um, from recreational vehicles and MTBE. Um, I'm not sure what EPA has done in terms of regulation. Um, I would have to look on that, look into that a bit more. But um, from my understanding, um, the main source of exposure is um, contaminated drinking water. Okay. Great. And then uh, we have um, a f another question from Barbara Warren. She wanted to know can, if you could cite other references on morbidity related to EDCs? Sure. So I think um, a, a really good place to start is the World Health Organization report. Um, that's about you know, 250 pages that really gets into the weeds in terms of um, morbidity. And I, and I have to say, you know, there's a lot of unknowns so when we talk about endocrine disrupting compounds, we're asking different toxicological questions than we were three or four decades ago. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, a, a lot of, you know, research and research questions looked into overt toxicity, and now we're starting to turn our heads toward low-dose low exposures or more subtle perturbations in hormone signaling that can actually lead to significant effects. Um, either later in life or, you know, um, through, you know, chronic exposure and, and sustained changes. And so I, I think we have a lot to learn about 
um, you know, morbidity associated with hormonally active compounds. There's quite a few epidemiological studies um, that make those connections, and, and I'll talk about several of those um, later on in the presentation. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I'd like to emphasize that although um, you know, environmental endocrine disruptors, you know, they've been the subject of study for quite some time. It's still sort of an emerging area of research in the grand scheme of toxicological assessment. And so, you know, what you might find is that, you know, there are more sort of clues that shift the weight of evidence towards, um, you know, what this actually means in terms of impacts on human health versus definitive answers. Okay. Did you want to take one more question before going on, or did you, because um, we... Uh, if, if there's time, that's fine. If we're, if we're being pushed on time, I can just move on. What, well, let's, how about we do one more quick one, and then um, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, continue on. Great. Karen, sure. Oh, Karen, Karen Sisler, had, Sisler had a question related to glyphosate um, or Roundup, mm -hmm. and she wanted to know mm -hmm. if you had any uh, thoughts on... EWG's, you know, recent report on the fact that they found a large number of breakfast foods having uh, glyphosate Roundup um, in in the breakfast foods. Sure. So, um, so this is not one of my areas of expertise, but I can speak sort of generally. Um, okay. So, you know, it, it's a concern. I'm sure some have seen the World Health Organization, the IARC report um, that expresses, you know, concerns regarding cancer and glyphosate. Um, it tends not to show up too much as a residue on, um, you know, fresh fruits and produce, but for some reason the limited testing that we do have shows that it can be present on um, grain. And so, you know, in light of, you know, the recent revela um, revelation that this compound, this pesticide, or herbicide, sorry, may be, um, you know, connected to cancer and other concerns, um, people may want to be more selective in, in what, they, uh, what they choose to, to eat. Um, to my understanding, though, the, the, the testing data, data on grains is somewhat limited, so, um, you know, again, I'd, I'd always like to see more data on that to get a broader picture of what's really happening. Great, okay. Um, so we'll take some more questions after the, after ne after the next section, um, and folks can also, it's fine if you want to go ahead and continue writing your answers in, but you can also, if you want, um, um, raise your hand and you can ask your question uh, via, via the phone as well, but either way works for us. Okay, thanks Joanna. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I next want to specifically talk about um, fire retardant chemicals. Um, these encompass a wide variety of synthetic chemicals that are meant to slow the spread of fire, although their efficacy has been debated. Um, as you can see from this slide, they vary considerably in structure. Um, and then they also vary considerably in toxicity. What I do want to bring your attention to is the structure in the middle, which is representative of a class of fire retardant chemicals called polybrominated diphenyl ethers, or PBDEs. So these are a type of fire retardant um, that was used widely um, for decades and was eventually phased out due to concerns about environmental persistence, uh, bioaccumulation up the food chain, and toxicity. Particularly, um, these, the, the chemical's ability to perturb thyroid hormone signaling. Um, however, although PBDEs have been phased out of the U.S. market, they've been replaced with alternatives. It doesn't mean fire retardant chemicals have, you know, have gone away. And those alternatives um, include all the other compounds that you see here. And these also come with toxicity concerns, which means that they may not be um, better or safer replacements. So fire retardant chemicals are found in a very broad array of consumer products. Um, upholstered furniture is a big category. A recent study found that 85% of the foam, of couch foam tested, had at least um, one or more fire retardant chemicals detectable. It's added to electronics, appliances, circuit boards, and even, even um, consumer products intended for babies, uh, including those that contain 
its foam cushioning. And I'd also like to mention that uh, many fire retardants are additive, which means they're added to the product, but they're not covalently bound to the molecules in the product itself, which means that they can more easily migrate out of these consumer products um, and into your home. And this is why they are very common contaminants in house dust, and they are also detectable in the breathable indoor air. So what do we know about PVDEs in terms of animal studies um, that have been phased out? We know quite a bit um, because uh, they, they warranted um, voluntary phase up from the U.S. market. So there was a pretty comprehensive ATSDR assessment in 2004 describing thyroid effects, neural behavioral alter alterations, immune system effects, um, myriad effects on um, sex steroids, um, disruption of sexual development in females, so affecting both male and female animals, and then neurodevelopmental effects in animals as well. And those were found in one study at levels that were similar to highly exposed infants and toddlers. So the, um, the doses that we're seeing in animals that elicited, elicited effects um, in them are also um, detectable in humans. So the human research, again, there's quite a bit about this. Um, serum levels in pregnant women are associated with changes in thyroid hormones. This may be concentration dependent. Um, PBDE exposure is associated with longer time to pregnancy, associated with cryptorchidism in newborn boys. Um, and then there's a number of other studies that suggest neural developmental impacts in children exposed to PBDEs, um, one specifically looking at um, poor attention, deficits in fine motor coordination, and cognition. And this study was part of the um, Shimako's cohort of school-age children. So I'd just like to um, very briefly mention why these effects could be happening. So if you look at the structure of thyroxin, you see there's a phenolic ring with um, two uh, halogen groups, an iodine oxy group. If you look at the structure of PBDEs, you also see a phenolic ring. You see a halogen group, which is the bromine. And then not pictured here, but after you metabolize PBDEs, after your body sort of processes these chemicals, a hydroxyl group is added. So that means that you have a structure at the end of the day that's very similar to the structure of the hormone thyroxine. So you could sort of plausibly see how these chemicals could be acting in the body. Um, we also see age-related patterns of exposure. Um, in 2010, we published a study showing that the serum levels of PBDEs in um, toddlers were higher than those detected in their mothers. And we think this is because of um, Increased hand-to-mouth behavior. Um, we know fire retardants accumulate on the dust. Um, that's typically found in the floor where um, infants and toddlers play. Um, they put their hands in their mouths. That could increase exposure. Um, however, although PBDEs have been phased out of the market, there are still home furnishings that may be older that contain them. If your couch was purchased before 2005, it's likely to contain PBDEs. And the problem isn't exactly isn't actually fixed in terms of toxic exposure. Um, the paper on the uh, left shows that even after PBDEs were phased out, there's still a broad suite of fire retardant chemicals detectable in house dust, including some of those replacement chemicals I showed in the first slide that are not necessarily worry-free. And so there are a number of studies on these replacement chemicals showing that they are associated with decreased um, sperm quality in men and hormone changes. There's mechanistic studies showing that they can actually interact with um, human nuclear hormone receptors. Um, exposure to a mixture called Firemaster 550 of these compounds causes obesity in rats. And there's a plethora of studies in zebrafish which are used as a model for um, looking at endocrine disruption and developmental toxicity showing effects such as um, neurodevelopmental neuro, uh, problems, um, behavioral changes, and morphological problems. So one of the recent um, research projects that we did was we wanted to see if these replacement fire retardants were following the same uh, trajectory of exposure as the PBDEs. So were there age-related differences um, in exposure to these replacement compounds that may be just as toxic as the ones that we've recently gotten rid of? Um, 
Duke uh, University's Nicholas School for the Environment partnered with us to do the laboratory analysis, and we recruited our study participants um, in partnership with Princeton Napa Pediatrics in New Jersey. Um, so what we looked for, we collected urine samples, and we looked at metabolites of specific um, fire retardant chemicals. Um, one uh, is referred to as chlorinated tris, or TDCIPP. This is a, uh, listed as a carcinogen under California's Proposition 65. It's associated with decreased semen quality and changes in sex steroid hormones. Um, the second compound, triphenylphosphate, and it's also associated with change levels. And this compound is also a suspected obesogen, um, which is a subclass of endocrine active chemicals. So these are compounds that may sensitize a person to weight gain. They may not, they, they don't directly contribute to weight gain, but they may cause sensitivity, and this may per, be particularly important if you're exposed um, perinatally, and we can talk a little bit about that more. Um, other metabolites um, that we looked for, um, uh, TBB, which is a reproductive developmental toxin lab, lab animals, and then another um, chlorinated uh, compound that has incomplete safety data. So it's important to know that some of these chemicals we don't have a lot of information about in order to make a, a judgment on whether or not they're safe. So we found that indeed um, the, the PBDE replacement chemicals seem to be following the same trajectory as the PBDEs in terms of age-related exposure. We found that Children um, had about three times higher exposure on average to triphenylphosphate um, compared to their mothers. Children had on average five times the levels of uh, the chlorinated tris metabolite in their urine compared to their mothers. And there was also a slightly elevated but insignificant um, increase in the isopropylated form of triphenylphosphate. And then if you look to the right, you can also see that there's a pretty good correlation between um, the levels of children's metabolites and the levels of mothers' metabolites for some fire retardant compounds showing the importance of a shared environment and exposure. Um, the last thing I mentioned is that we did um, administer a survey looking at predictors of exposure. Um, and as suspected, we find that hand-to-mouth contacts were a significant predictor of exposure um, for uh, children's uh, levels of uh, urinary fire retardant metabolites. So if you want uh, more information on this particular study, there's a peer-reviewed publication in Environmental Science and Technology, that's 2014, and then there's a more sort of consumer-friendly report available on our website at ewg.org. And then I also just wanted uh, to mention that in addition to this New Jersey cohort, we did um, a companion study in California. The reason being that in California, there was a flammability standard for furniture that didn't exist anywhere else in the country that virtually forced um, furniture manufacturers to use fire retardants in every piece of upholstered furniture. And so although we know that um, the use of these compounds in furniture is widespread across the US, you can almost guarantee yourself that every single thing, you know, sitting in your living room in terms of upholstered furniture, if you live in California, has these chemicals. So if we wanted to see if um, regulations actually influence people's exposure. And as expected, we found out that in some cases, yes, they did. Um, in California, there were higher um, chlorinated tris and isopropylated triphenylphosphate metabolite levels um, in the California children compared to um, the cohort in New Jersey. They were about two and a half times higher in California. And we also know um, in mom, mothers as well, which may be reflective of the flammability standard, which really points to the importance of misguided um, regulations resulting in you know, increased exposure to potentially harmful, harmful chemicals. Consistent with the New Jersey cohort, hand and mouth behavior was associated with higher exposures. And again, children's exposures were higher on average six times higher than mothers for the triphenylphosphate and 15 times higher than mothers for the chlorinated TRIF compound, which comes with the carcinogenic concerns. So recommendations on preventing exposure. Um, I will caveat this with um, because there are no mandatory um, 
national labeling laws, it's very difficult in some cases to know whether or not the products you're bringing into your home do contain fire retardants. However, due to recent regulatory changes that have given manufacturers more options in terms of meeting flammability standards without the use of fire retardants, there's more, um, there, there are more products available that are free of these chemicals. So purchase furniture and baby products free of fire retardants. Some of them will now have labels on them. Um, if not, I would ask the retailer or manufacturer. If you're reupholstering old furniture, um, it's a good idea to replace the, the foam um, with fire retardant free polyurethane foam. Um, you can inspect furniture for damage. As I said, these chemicals e easily migrate out of both intact and damaged furniture. Um, but there may be a higher migration rate if the furniture is damaged, and particularly if it's older. There was a recent study, I think that came out this month, showing that um, older furniture is much more likely to leach these chemicals as the foam breaks down versus newer furniture that does a better job of keeping them inside. Uh, you can vacuum your home with a HEPA filter. This HEPA filter helps remove um, smaller particulates. Um, so I mentioned that house dust was an important source of exposure, so it can help sort of clean up some of that contaminated dust. And then finally, be careful of carpeting. Um, if you peel up wall-to-wall -wall carpet and it has backing behind it, usually that's made of um, recycled foam that can contain fire retardant chemicals, so you would want to keep that contained. Uh, so that concludes the, um, the sort of more specific section on fire retardant chemicals and endocrine disruption um, and age-related exposure. So if there are additional questions, I would be happy to answer them now. Sure. Uh, jo Joanna, this is Kathy. So there, there is a couple of uh, written ones. Um, Linda Lane was asking about pajama retardant. Um, Maybe you could talk a little bit about children's pajamas and how that how that's handled. Yes. So uh, back in the 70s, um, children's pajamas were treated with chemical fire retardants. Um, one of them being the chlorinated tris compound that I mentioned. Another being a brominated tris compound. Um, there were uh, studies that were done at that time showing that children who wore those pajamas. Um, with the brominated form of the compound actually had higher levels of uh, the metabolite in their urine after wearing the pajamas. And so those chemicals were um, taken out of use in children's pajamas. We've looked um, quite a bit into what pajama manufacturers or children's clothing manufacturers are doing today to meet flammability standards. As far as we can tell, um, there's not additive fire retardant chemicals in kids' pajamas anymore. Um, the the um, avoid, avoiding uh, flammability standard has more to do with the fit, so you have to have close-fitting clothing. Um, and they also use uh, materials that are sort of inherently um, resistant to flame and aren't soaked in these additive chemicals as the polyurethane foam in your couch may be. So th this is Kathy. So even the even like the fleece pajamas, those are not. That's not an issue with like the fleece ones because I, I have two little kids, and so I always make sure to buy like the cotton based ones, and I kind of stay away from the fleece ones. But is that kind of just? I don't. I don't need necessarily need to worry about the the fleece. No. Yeah, you know, it's it's, it's interesting, be, and it was surprising as far as we could tell. Um, there, there are not chemicals that are sort of added to the pajamas. Now, some of the materials that may be inherently fire resistant could have um, some compounds that are bound to the fiber to help that flammability resistance. But we're not talking about the same situation as upholstered furniture and polyurethane foam, or even electronics or appliances for that matter, where they're just sort of doused in there in the mix and they can easily migrate out. That's my understanding of the current market. Well, that's good to know. Um, so there's another question. Uh, Dr. Susan Katz had a question related to um, fire retardant chemicals in auto 
autoimmune diseases. She wanted to know if there's any evidence linking gardens with auto, autoimmune diseases, which are also, she's saying that because autoimmune diseases are increasing, she wanted to know if there was any link between the two. Sure. Um, so there, you know, I'm, there's some evidence of that. Um, it's, I, I don't think, and, and you know, this is in the form of sort of like independent peer-reviewed studies. I don't think there's, that I know of there's been a weight of assessment, weight of evidence assessment on that. Um, that, you know, and I haven't seen a lot of epidemiology on that as well. Most of the epi I've seen on fire retardant chemicals has had to do with endocrine disruption and obesity and not necessarily immune effects. Um, what I would look for, there, there was a lot of analysis. So the Centers for Disease Control has a, um, a survey. It's called the NHANES survey. Um, it's a national you know, health and nutrition survey where they also collect biospecimens from people. And a lot of independent researchers um, take the results of that biomonitoring. So they monitor for things like fire retardants, parabens, um, a number of environmental, you know, endocrine disruptors, and they sort of look at, compare that to, to disease rate. So if you're interested, I, I may look there to see if there's been any um, analysis of the NHANES data as it relates to autoimmune. Okay, great. And so there are there are also a couple of questions related to imported products, imported clothing or imported the pajamas, wanting to know, you know, what do we know about the safety and reliability of information about these products? So that's tricky. Um, the, so these, you know, the PBDEs have been phased out of use in the U.S. Um, two of them have been banned in the EU, and then DECA is highly restricted, um, which is a third type of PBDE. But, you know, we know that there is still some production of those compounds overseas. You know, the same is true for other chemicals that we're concerned about, like um, PFOA and perfluorinated chemicals. Um, so it's, that, that, that's a tricky question, and, and it's, it's harder to tell. Okay. All right, why don't we take one more. There was a question about when you were talking about foam, um, how old, when, you know, when you say the older foam have, have, have had these fire retardants, um, you know, how, how old are you, you know, when are you going to the 60s, 70s? And then there was kind of a follow-up question, were these flame retardants used back in the 70s, um, used in mattresses as well? So in terms of how old does the foam have to be, I mean, I think that it's, it's the, the, the concern is when it starts to break down, right? So, that, so that's going to depend on use. You know, if you have a very well-loved couch that's a couple decades old, um, you know, the risk of migration may be higher than if you have, you know, a love seat in a guest bedroom that hasn't been used that much. So it's really, you know, sort of the wear and tear that's related to, um, to migration out of the product. Um, if you're interested in finding uh, more specific details on age. Uh, there was a study published, I think, this year that looked at, um, it was a swap out study where they looked at the levels of fire retardants in the dust of um, college dormitory facilities before they replaced all of the couches with new couches that also contained fire retardants. And then they compared the levels of the fire retardants when the old couches were around versus, you know, over a short period of time when the new couches were around. And so that may give you some more accurate numbers on, on age, you know, how old those couches were. But again, it's difficult because, you know, it has to do with, with wear and tear and use and not necessarily just the age alone. Great. So I think why don't we continue on and then we'll, we'll take some more questions in a little bit. Thanks, Joanna. Okay. Um, so the next topic I want to cover um, are environmental uh, endocrine disruptors in personal care products. Um, you know, we're not just talking about fire retardants here, but this is actually a nice segue because some of the chemicals that are used as fire retardants have more than one purpose. So um, triethyl phosphate, which um, I just discussed in the last section, is also used as a plasticizer. 
um, in plastics, including um, nail polish. And this is something that we noticed as we were doing this fire retardant research, that you know a significant number of nail polish bottles had triphenylphosphate listed as an ingredient. So our question was, um, is this a significant source of exposure to this um, environmental, this um, endocrine disrupting chemical that's also connected to obesity? And I'd like to say a few more things about that. So in 2012, um, there was a study with um, rats who were perinatally exposed to a fire retardant mixture called Firemaster 550. And one of the components of that mixture was triphenylphosphate and its isopropylated forms. Um, one of the outcomes of that study is that uh, mice that were exposed before and after birth to this mixture developed obesity later in life. So that raised these questions about, you know, is it a component of this mixture that could be specifically causing the obesity? Is it the mixture itself? So researchers went on to do a series of mechanistic experiments where they separated out the components of the Firemaster 550 mixture and did a series of experiments in cells um, looking at possible um, endocrine disrupting endpoints. And what they found was triphenylphosphate specifically is an agonist for the PPAR gamma receptor, which is sort of considered this master regulator of adipogenesis. Um, it directs immature cells um, on whether or not to become adipocytes or bone cells. Um, it regulates many um, aspects of fat metabolism and metabolic homeostasis. And then I recently um, saw a poster that, with research that I believe has yet to be published um, at a conference showing that coming full circle, rats treated specifically with triphenylphosphate, not just the Firemaster 550 um, mixture, developed obesity and had accelerated um, rates of type 2 diabetes mellitus. So that really points to, you know, this chemical being an environmental obesogen. So the research question was, um, does applying something as simple as applying nail polish with this ingredient um, contribute to exposure? So what we did in the, at the very top, um, we had study participants. We collected urine samples from study participants before they applied nail polish directly to their nails and in a time course afterwards. And as you can see below on the bottom left, um, you know, there was some background exposure before nail polish application, um, a little bit of an uptick two to six hours after application, but not significant. But 10 to 14 hours af after application, there was a nearly seven-fold increase on average of the urinary metabolite of this compound. Uh, the second question that we wanted to ask, which is important when you're talking about personal care products, is what's the route of exposure? Is this going to be absorbed through my skin? Um, triphenylphosphate is semi-volatile. Is, is inhalation a concern? And so uh, at the top, and you can see in cohort two, we did a series of experiments where, you know, as before, we had participants apply. Take, we took urine samples from participants before they applied and after they applied in the time course of the 48 hours. Then we had participants apply nail polish um, to synthetic nails that were attached to a glove that they wore on their hand. And so this would eliminate the dermal route of exposure and focus on the um, inhalation route of exposure. And then there was the control group. So you can see from the graph on the bottom um, right, uh, the control and the glove painting phase had fairly similar levels of urinary metabolites of this compound, indicating that inhalation was not um, as an important route of exposure. And please keep in mind that this isn't a consumer um, application scenario, so we don't know if this will hold true for people that actually work in nail salons where they, were, where they could be breathing fumes for a prolonged period of time. So the results come with that caveat. But um, when the participants applied the polish directly to their nails, um, you can see that there was a significant increase in urinary metabolite levels. Um, nail polish is not the only um, cosmetic or personal care product that's, that can contain environmental disrupting chemicals. Um, a number of ones that have been in the spotlight include parabens, which are um, weak estrogenic compounds. These are found in makeup, moisturizer, and body wash and act as a preservative. Phthalates, um, which are added to fragrance. These are, um, can be reproductive and developmental toxicants. 
oxybenzone, also a weak estrogen um, agonist. This is a UV filter found in sunscreens. And then finally, triclosan, which is an, is an antimicrobial agent found in soaps, body wash, and even toothpaste. And I would just like to point out, um, again, going back to, you know, the structure mechanistic um, aspect of things, if you, rem if you remember those um, phenolic hydroxylated and, hen and halogenated rings from the um, thyroxine and PVDE example, this has a similar structure and is suspected of disrupting thyroid hormones um, similar to PVDEs. So this was a really interesting study um, published by another group um, this year. Uh, this was Kim Harley's group. It's, it was part of the Hermosa study. Uh, what they had was um, a group of teenage girls who were asked to, you know, go about their daily personal care product routine. And then um, there was a washout period, and they were given alternative personal care products that were known not to contain phthalates, parabens, or the phenols like the triclosan triclosan and um, oxybenzone, or BP3. And they looked at urinary metabolites of these compounds while they were using their normal personal care products, and they cataloged whether or not they contained these compounds. And then after the washout period, and they had used the alternatives that were free of these compounds for a number of days. And so as you can see, the percent change for um, urinary, urinary metabolites of phthalates, there was a decrease. Um, for some urinary metabolites of parabens, there was a significant decrease up to 45% and 43% for methyl and propyl parabens. And then triclosan and oxybenzone um, metabolites also decreased significantly as well. And so this really goes into the recommendations is that personal choices absolutely do matter. Um, and people can, you know, read the labels and avoid products that contain these ingredients. Um, personal care products are required to list um, their ingredients except for the fragrance ingredients. And so people can really make informed choices at the point of sale um, at, at the store as they're considering buying these different products. Um, one resource that our organization offers is our Skin Deep database. Um, this is a database that rates different personal care products and will tell you what ingredients are in each one. You can find that at ewg.org slash skin deep. And then it's also important to remember that teenagers, and I should also add pregnant women in particular, should really pay attention to personal care product labels. Um, you know, their bodies or, you know, the growing fetus is going through these critical stages of development that I mentioned earlier, um, and exposure to endocrine disruptors should be avoided. Uh, so that concludes my section on personal care products and EDCs. Um, I was gonna. I had a few very quick slides on BPA, but I can take questions if there are any um, before I go into those. Yeah, it looks like there's just, there's one question related to the um, the TPHP and obesity. Um, Patricia Nance wanted to know if was if there was any correlation seen with food intake or activity levels in the exposed rats versus the controls. So does, um, for the rat study from 2012, um, the, in, in terms of the exposure scenario, it was the same. They were, they were given the same um, diet in weight. Um, so there wasn't any difference in, um, in food intake. But if I remember correctly, the poster that I saw at um, the conference where the rats were specifically fed and not the Firemaster 550 mixture, there was a propensity in the treated animals to eat more. Um, that study has not been published, so you know I can't go back and check. And and that sort of raises questions. It's like it's a chicken or the egg thing, right? Did the did the treatment cause changes in appetites um, that compelled the rest to eat more or, you know, what, it, it, it makes you sort of wonder what's going on there and it raises some really good questions, particularly because those, um, those rats had accelerated development of um, type 2 diabetes. Great. I think th that was the only question I saw uh, for this section. Okay. 
Um, so I'll just touch very quickly on bisphenol A. It's been a very hot button issue in terms of research and um, what people are doing policy wise. So BPA is a um, it's an estrogenic chemical that has been shown to have quite a few of biological quite a few biological effects in animals. Everything from hormone disruption, um, obesity. Uh, there's been some connections to liver cancer, potentially affecting sexually dimorphic parts of the brain. It's used in polycarbonate plastic, um, so number seven plastic. Because of the concerns surrounding BPA, the FDA decided to um, bar its use in baby bottles and infant feeding containers. Um, it's also used to line um, canned, in, in the lining of canned food, there's this epoxy resin that's in the inside of um, food cans that um, contains BPA, which can leach out at low levels into the food. So many animal studies, I'll just mention a few of the human studies that are of um, some interest. So I mentioned the, um, the Center for Disease Control Biomonitoring Program. One of the chemicals that they look for is BPA. Um, they find it in most of the thousands of samples tested. Um, Califat found 92% uh, in, in a paper she published in 2008, and those levels have not necessarily gone down. Higher urinary concentrations in the um, epidemiological studies comparing, in some cases, the NHANES data to disease outcome or morbidity. Um, show that um, higher exposures are associated with a number of diseases, including prediabetes and diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, um, PAD, and then um, a handful of studies have associated exposure with lower birth weight. And I also just, you know, wanted to emphasize that we're we're seeing more and more that increasing levels of um, urinary BPA are positive positively associated with metabolic syndrome and obesity, and obesity in adults and children. And, you know, as the scientific community sort of increasingly turns their eye toward um, compounds in the environment that can encourage weight gain, you know, this is, this is um, certainly one of them. So because there's been so much controversy about this particular compound and there's been a lot of um, fight about how to regulate it, uh, the NIH has organized this multi-year, multi-institutional study, nicknamed the Clarity Study, to sort of definitively, um, with some quotation marks around that, decide whether or not bisphenol A um, is really a threat to um, human health based on some of the animal models that, that they have. And so we're still waiting for the results of that study. Um, I heard at the Society of Toxicology meeting three years ago that they were going to be released in a year, and we're still waiting on it. So, um, so more to come there. Um, but I did want to say, you know, like personal care products, um, you know, personal choices really do matter when it comes to avoiding exposure. So this is the result of a 2011 study done at Harvard's crossover study of 75 people who either ate um, fresh soup or canned soup. And on the right, you can see um, the specific gravity-adjusted urinary levels after eating the two different types of soup, canned soup being lined with um, the uh, BPA epoxy resin and fresh soup, of course, freshly prepared, so um, no exposure. And the conclusion was that um, consumption of one serving of canned soup daily over five days was associated with a more than 1,000 increase in urinary BPA. So again, personal choices matter. Um, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a great recommendation to give. Um, so you can buy le less canned food, which is healthier for you anyway, um, or choose canned food that's free of BPA. I will say that with some reservation, though, because you want to make sure whatever the alternative is also safe. And there's some questions about um, adequate safety testing data for BPA alternatives. Um, BPA is also used to coat thermal receipts, so it's used to set the ink in the paper receipts that you often get at the store. Um, biomonitoring data has shown that um, cashiers who handle these receipts quite a bit throughout the day have higher levels of urinary BPA after their shift than before. And so um, you may want to ask for an e-receipt or just avoid paper receipts if possible. 
Um, you know, sometimes I, I just tell them, you know, when I'm at the grocery store, I, I don't necessarily need a receipt. And then polycarbonate plastics will be marked with the recycling symbol 7. Um, so if you want to avoid food containers um, that are made of polycarbonate and could uh, potentially leach BPA, avoid number 7. Um, are there any questions? I don't see any um, written questions, and I. But I had a. So, are they still in terms of the paper receipts? So, they are. They're still a majority of the um, paper receipts, cash register receipts, still have BPA or or some type of phenol in them. I had thought. Um, I'm not sure. I, I would I would assume that yes, either BPA okay. or one of its analogs is still fairly okay. commonly okay. used in paper receipts. I know that um, one of the alternatives was a structural analog called BPS, which mm -hmm. actually has some of the exact same concerns as BPA. So that's what you could call a regrettable substitution, where you're just swapping out one thing for something that could be equally toxic or, or toxic via different endpoints. And that's much of you know, the similar situation that we saw with PBDEs and some of these alternative fire retardant chemicals. Um, the EPA's Design for the Environment program did do um, an alternatives assessment for BPA in thermal receipts. And so I'm not sure how much the market has shifted in you know, response to that assessment. It's fairly recent. It's only a couple years old. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Um, it's not like, you know, your BPA receipt has a label on it or anything. So right. um, you don't have, have quite the market pressure um, that you do with other things. But mm -hmm. um, I, I would assume it's, it's fairly to somewhat common still in, in paper receipts or BPS. Great. Okay, so the final section of this presentation, um, I want to focus on phthalates, and I want to focus on one particular, in particular, diethyl hexyl phthalate. And the reason why I want to talk about this is because it's, uh, exposure can be very specific to um, medical treatment. So what does the toxicology behind DEHP tell us? There is a huge body of information on this. There have been comprehensive assessments done um, by government agencies in the U.S and Europe. So the key endpoint of concern is developmental and reproductive toxicity. Um, a major target seems to be um, young male animals or baby boys. So we have seen um, in animals um, pretty marked um, adverse effects on the real male reproductive system, including Sertoli cell vacuolization, aplastic testes, decreased testicular weight, um, atrophy in the seminiferous tubule, and then there's been some suggestive um, evidence in humans as well. Uh, there's also um, some evidence of um, promoting an inflammatory process and immunosuppression. So in people, um, there's a relationship between DEHP metabolites and um, altered hormone levels and signaling. This includes thyroid hormones. Um, testosterone, alterations in um, steroid hormones, and also um, damage to uh, DNA and sperm. Uh, there were two studies that showed an association with reduced anal genital distance in baby boys and exposure to DEHP, uh, lower gestational age, and also a correlation between um, exposure and premature breast development. And so the reason why I wanted to bring up um, you know, this particular compound with this group is because a very significant source of exposure um, can be medical treatment. And um, there's been a lot of concern expressed about exposure with um, neonates, um, you know, young children in the NICU or PICU um, because of its potential effects, adverse effects on um, reproduction and development. So according to the FDA, um, there's a number of medical procedures that pose the highest risk of exposure to DEHP. Um, these include exchange transfusion in neonates, ECMO in neonates, um, TPN in neonates, particularly when they're uh, with lipids in a, in a PVC bag. So a lot of um, medical equipment is made from um, polyvinyl chloride plastic.
the EHP is a common plasticizer in those items. Uh, multiple procedures in, um, in sick neonates can lead to high cumulative exposure, and I'll show um, a few studies that demonstrate that in a moment, um, as well as uh, hemodialysis. So in terms of exposure in the medical setting, um, there was a 2014 uh, study that estimated the total daily exposure for an intubated 2 kilogram critically ill in infant is 4,000 and 160,000 times higher than desired to avoid male reproductive and hepatic toxicities. Um, DEHP is also known to um, induce liver enzymes. Um, and so it also has a connection to um, cancer and altered metabolism in the, lip, in the liver. A separate study found that um, the intensiveness of DEHP-containing product use is associated with um, metabolites detectable in urine, and that the concentrations of these metabolites um, among the infants who were treated um, with many uh, medical devices containing DEHP plus PVC were 13 to 14 times higher than the low intensity group. Um, and then one of the last points I want to bring up is that there's also co-exposure concerns in terms of BPA. So infants um, with high intensity exposure to DEHP containing medical devices had an almost nine times increase in body burden in um, BPA compared to the low intensity group. So we're not just talking about one endocrine disrupting chemical in the mix here, we're talking about at least two. Uh, this was a study that caught my eye um, that was published late last year um, that actually followed um, outcomes uh, throughout uh, later in life with infants that were um, treated with DEHP-containing medical devices, and it found that um, exposure to metabolites during intensive care was independently and robustly associated with ADHD um, in children four years after critical illness. So this indicates that, you know, again, there's this, this theme of exposure around critical windows of development, gestationally or, um, you know, close to the postnatal period, can have um, lasting effects later in life. So the good news is, is that medical facilities can and have um, done something about this to, to reduce exposure. I would strongly encourage you to go to the Healthcare Without Harm website. They have a number of case studies at these various um, medical facilities. You know, Kaiser Permanente is a, is a huge um, system, uh, Miller's Children's Hospital smaller, so both, you know, larger, larger institutions and smaller facilities have um, successfully made attempts to replace PVC, DEHP plasticized PVC equipment with alternatives to reduce exposure um, in NICUs and PICUs and, and reduce exposure in neonates. Um, so please go to their website. There, you know, there, there's papers on how other healthcare systems have done this um, and tips on how you can do it as well. Um, phase outs haven't just happened in the US. Um, France has actually banned the use of feeding tubes containing DEHP in pediatric and neonatology wards. Um, Sweden um, has a DEHP-free feeding tubes, as well as um, a clinic in Vienna. Um, I will also say that there are other phthalates that are structurally similar to DEHP that are associated with the exact same concerns in terms of um, developmental and reproductive toxicity. And so, um, Healthcare systems and others have also considered um, phasing out equipment with dibutyl phthalate and butyl benzyl phthalate, although to my understanding, DEHP was the most widely used plasticizer in PVC plastic. So I'll try to end on a happy note there. Um, so that concludes the talk. Um, if anyone has additional questions about any of the case studies um, on exposure or um, questions on endocrine disruptors in general, I'd be happy to take them now. Sure, the, uh, this is Kathy, and so we do have a couple of uh, qu uh, questions. Uh, Judy Lubera wanted to know which phthalate is associated with increased incidence of preterm birth?
join us. Um, yeah, Joanna, we can't hear you. Hello? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, now we can. Now we can. We oh, have okay. Just, just for a few sorry, minutes. sir. That's okay. okay. Um, so the studies that I cite here um, are specific to DEHP, but I think um, more importantly, it's it's important to look at exposure cumulatively. So as I mentioned, it's not P that's associated with what is now called phthalate syndrome, which is the sort of male reproductive, the suite of male reproductive effects that you get. Some of these studies not only look at DEHP, but they also look at cumulative exposure to a number of phthalates, um, and, and those citations are not included here. Um, so, you know, collectively looking at the, um, the total um, phthalate metabolite load in infant urine and um, lower gestational age or, or other birth outcomes I, I think is important. Again, in these slides I just focused on the one chemical, but it's important to look at it from a cumulative perspective. Great. And uh, Melody Chrislock wanted to know if, um, if you could refer her to any labs where an individual could submit some samples of house dust or water to test for these toxic compounds? So um, Heather Stapleton's lab at Duke University, she's the principal investigator who we worked with um, on the fire retardant metabolites. She has a, um, a standing research project where people can submit samples of couch foam to her lab. And um, she will do the analysis and tell you, you know, what and how many and at what levels. In terms of dust analysis, it's really, really expensive to do. Um, Heather's lab does that as well, but um, she does not take individual samples for dust, just the couch, the, the, the foam in the couches and other upholstered furniture, baby products, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I, I can't refer to um, to a specific laboratory in terms of dust testing. A lot of universities are doing it, but because it's expensive and time consuming, you sort of have to be part of a research cohort. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then Trish Trish O'Day had a question regarding um, do soup and chicken broth in soft sided soft-sided containers also contain BPA? So the Tetra packs, which are the, the cartons, um, those are uh, BPA-free, uh, to my knowledge, and they sort of advertise themselves as that. So it's, it's really the epoxy lining in, the, um, in canned food where you would um, need to think about exposure to BPA, not the Tetra packs. And then it looks like uh, Melody just had a follow-up question about, um, I think it's related to her question regarding labs and testing. She wanted to know if, um, about w testing for water, testing, I guess, testing your water, if, if there were any labs who might do that as well, or if you knew any. Mm -hmm. any. Um, so if you, I, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of labs that'll test your drinking water. Um, people do it for well water in particular all the time um, because that doesn't come from a, from a city pipe where they actually do monitor for certain contaminants. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I can't recommend a specific one, but I'm, I'm sure you could, you know, easily find one that would test your water. The tricky thing is you want to know what to test for. You want to consider what the labs, you know, me methods are, if there are a limit of detection, is sufficient for the chemical that you're looking for. You know, some compounds are known to, um, you know, be harmful at fairly do low doses. In some cases, the methodology to look for these compounds hasn't, you know, developed to the point where 
um, you know, they can commercially and easily and cheaply be, be tested in, in various matri matrices, whether it be, you know, water, soil, blood, anything. So, um, yeah. Okay. And then um, Trish O'Day had a question related to whether a leather sofa would have less release of flame retardants over time than an upholstered sofa? That's a good question. Um, so, yeah, so permeability of the cover material may play a role. So fire retardants are released in the vapor phase as well as in particulate form. Or, you know, fire retardants that are released in the vapor phase can adhere to particles and then, you know, become available in the particulate form. Um, I haven't seen any research about rate of release based on cover material. Um, I've just seen research on release based on age and, you know, the whether or not the, the foam is, or the, the furniture is damaged or in a state of disrepair. So that's actually a good question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um. So, Patri so there's a uh, Patricia question about, um, she had a question, her question was, what is the data on risk benefits of fire resistant products? Sure. So, um, the old California standard um, was based on an open flame test. And so, the foam had to withstand ignition for 12 seconds of exposure to an open flame. So you could picture something like a candle or a lighter. The reason why um, that standard was, or part of the reason why that standard was changed, um, in addition to the toxicity concerns about fire retardants, is that the leading cause of furniture fire death is from smoldering sources, which, which are basically cigarettes. And so the flammability standard shifted from this open flame test to a smolder standard, which um, the regulators thought would better um, account for furniture fire safety. Um, there have been studies by the US um, Department of Commerce, as well as, I believe, the, Sum the Consumer Product Safety Commission, showing that in the end, the use of fire retardant chemicals actually does not improve furniture fire safety. Because what will happen is that after those 12 seconds of you know, ignition exposure, it's going to go up in flames and flashover will be created very quickly. Um, so whether or not 12 seconds is you know, adequate time for you to get out of the house and prevent death, I guess, is up for debate. But um, I think that the general agreement is that um, the open flame test didn't do much to improve furniture fire safety. Um, the smolder standard, which can be met with technology that does not basically require, the, the law never outward, like outright required the use of fire retardant chemicals, but it pretty much forced the manufacturers to use them because that was the only way they could meet the standard. Um, the new one, you know, encourages the use of, of alternate technologies and um, people who are um, fire safety experts think that that may actually do something to improve furniture fire safety. Great. No, thank you, Joanna. I think it looks like that. Um, well, well, it looks like there's one, one more question. It looks like uh, Melody had one more question related to bottled water and whether or not um, EWG has tested um, bottled water on the market. And it looks like she specifically also was looking for, um, she had a question about whether you all had tested for bottled water on the market and then also related to um, testing drinking water for MTBE and whether you know if there are any labs who are doing that or if um, it looks like those were her two main questions. Okay. So in terms of um, bottled water testing, I believe we've done some, but the issue is that it's really hard to know what to look for, right? Because you're dealing with this composite plastic um, 
and then you know there are conditions that can influence leachability. For example, if you leave bottled water, you know, in the back of a in, in the trunk of like a 120 degree that's 120 degrees in a car, you may get higher rates of leaching. So it's sort of tricky because you need to know what compounds you're looking for, and we don't necessarily always know that. Um, and then you have all these different conditions um, as well. So uh, you know that that we've done very limited work um, in that area. In terms of MTBE, um, I can't remember if that is if that is considered by the EPA um, an unregulated contaminant. So what EPA will do is they'll monitor drinking water for certain contaminants that don't have regulatory limits, but they just kind of want to know to see what's to see what's going on. Um, and and that might be one of them. I'm I'm honestly like I, I can't be I'm sorry I can't be more helpful in terms of you know where what where the regulatory landscape is in, in terms of MTBE. But I would go to the EPA's website and just see what they have on it. Mm -hmm. And then actually um, they look like there's one more uh, another question. Judy Lubera had a question regarding um, she's heard that ph phthalates are excreted fairly rapidly through, through through urine. She wanted to know if that's right. Um, and then she also wanted to know, do they also accumulate in any particular place, um, any other particular place in the body, any certain organs? Um, so phthalates are rapidly excreted. They, they do have a short half-life in the body, um, which, which is good unless you are exposed on a daily basis, right? And so what biomonitoring shows us with um, compounds that are rapidly excreted, which includes phthalates, it includes BPA, it includes um, the alternative fire retardants that I was talking about, you know, we think the half-life of those is, is a couple days. But if you, you know, if, if you're chronically and constantly exposed, then you're just going to be constantly that. So it becomes more of a concern. Um, even if your if your body can um, get rid of them quickly, um, in terms of where phthalates are stored, um, I know that the best matrix to look for them is urine. Um, in terms of where they would tend to bioaccumulate, um, you know, they're processed by the liver. They may have some toxic effects there. I would imagine they would be um, you know, detectable at fairly low levels in serum. Um, and I, yeah, I, that's, that's basically what I know. Okay. Um, and then Patricia Nance also had a question related to the data on exposure from uh, receipts. And she wanted to know if the data was related to studies um, on consumers, or was it for workers? Um, yeah, she wants to know if, 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 yeah, if it was workers or consumers the data came from. Sure. So um, EWG did analysis of the NHANES data, and that was specific to occupation. Um, the study that I mentioned was also specific to occupation, but if I remember correctly, um, there was another study that was a little, it was a little funny, I think it was published in 2015, where it looked at exposure, um, consumer exposure, after they had been handling receipts and had treated their hands with, um, with uh, sanitizing hand wash. So it's basically alcohol that's a penetration enhancer and, and would facilitate presumably the absorption of the BPA. Um, so I, I, the, I believe, if I remember correctly, there's been one study on, at least one study on consumer exposure to BPA. Um, but the ones that seem to be a little more, um, in, involve more people and are a little more well organized are, are occupational exposure. Okay, great. And it looks, it looks like, um, Yes, I think I think that looks like all of the questions. And then um, there was a question related to if 
we have email um, if in terms of follow-up questions. And if folks do have follow-up questions, they can email me, and then I can um, get in touch with Joanna um, with any questions um, that still remain. And so um, I will give you my email, and that's K A. T-T-A-R at PSR.org. Um, it was also, my email was also on the registration information as well. So, um, so if folks have additional questions going forward, just feel free to give me, uh, email me and then I can um, go ahead and, and get the answer to you. Um, so I, I just really wanted to thank uh, Dr. Congleton um, for tonight's presentation. It was, I think it's tremendously helpful um, and it really highlights how um, as a healthcare provider you can offer specific tips that can really make a difference in terms of the public and your patients um, exposures to endoc endocrine disruptors um, and so um, it, it really it, you really can reduce their risks if you are um, you know counseling patients on on these issues and so I just want to thank Joanna for uh, presenting tonight. Um, and I also wanted to thank uh, Julia Morgan, who's our web manager. She uh, made sure everything ran smoothly tonight, so I wanted to give a, a big thanks to her as well. And so um, the webinar, tonight's presentation, will be available on our website within the next few days for folks um, to review for future reference. And everyone who attended tonight or everyone who actually signed up for the webinar should be receiving, will, will receive a link to the, uh, the um, webinar once it's posted on our website. And then we are also, hopefully folks will sign up for our, um, our next Train the Trainer webinar, which is going to be focusing, as I mentioned at the start of this uh, presentation, on outdoor air toxics, and so um, specifically urban fr fracking. And so there should be an email coming out um, within the next few weeks or so to register for that. Um, and it's probably the webinar, the date of the webinar, this outdoor air toxics webinar is going to be probably at the end of May. Um, so just keep an eye out for that. Um, and I think that's it. And I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Um, and uh, have a good rest of the night. Thank you.